Hi everyone and welcome to this edition of Sound Bites. My name is Stephen Reagan. I'm the principal privacy consultant and subject matter expert on privacy and data protection at Rangu. In addition, I'm an American lawyer as well as a fellow at the Center for Internet and Human Rights. Uh, with these sound bites, I just like to give a quick recap of some uh, some important events that have, that have happened in the privacy and data protection world. In particular, today I'm going to talk about four different items. I'm going to begin with uh, some recent rulings in Europe uh, related to the use of American service providers. So, as uh, some of you may know. Um, this is all on the heels of the decision by the Court of Justice for the Euro European Union in the Schrems II decision that invalidated the privacy shield and the transfer mechanism um, between the U European Union and the United States. In the aftermath, um, these cases have arose in particular in France, Germany, and now Portugal. The case in France was uh, decided by a court while the decisions in Germany and Portugal related to decisions by the data protection authorities. Uh, from there, I'm gonna speak maybe briefly on data localization uh, before pivoting to looking at some developments in privacy legislation, particularly related to China and India. Uh, this will manage the, uh, and protect the data of some three billion people in the world, so they are really, you know, really relevant and really useful to look at. Uh, and then from there, I'm going to turn to the United Kingdoms. Uh, in in particular, there is an important case ongoing there uh, that's being argued, or that was argued on April 28th and April 29th before the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom. And the relevant case is Lloyd v. Google where Lloyd, Mr. Lloyd is seeking to bring a class action lawsuit on, be, um, on behalf of uh, some 4.4 million iPhone users, and he is hoping to do it uh, by himself. So that's really the main issue that the Supreme Court is grappling with at the moment, whether or not an individual can bring a, a lawsuit on behalf of a class of individuals who are not joined to the to the actual lawsuit. Uh, and then I'm going to round up with a, a little bit of a, a look at some technological developments, in particular looking at Spotify's speech recognition pattern that purports to identify uh, an individual's taste attributes from uh, auditory signals. Uh, and this is uh, also relevant as Amazon has a similar patent with its Alexa product. So with that, I will just really dive into it. There's a whole bunch of things to, uh, to talk about. All right, so I'm gonna begin with by looking at some recent decisions in Europe, um, really about managing uh, data, data storage and cloud service providers and using third, third countries, where there is a potential for the data to be accessed by government authorities in that third country. This is the main concern that came out of the uh, Schrems II decision. Um, again, just to recap that case really quickly, this was a decision that came out in July of 2020 by the, uh, from the Court of Justice for the European Union, where the court invalidated the privacy shield, the transfer mechanism that allowed data to be transferred from Europe to the United States without any additional safeguards. Uh, in invalidating that decision, the court really kind of created a, a complex situation for, for organizations who want to transfer data from, from Europe to any third country, not just the United States. So what's come out of that is a really, a, a really large concern uh, from commenters, commenters on the topic of data localization. And uh, now data localization is, is you know, in informal policy that would require data to stay within the jurisdiction or sovereign borders of a, a country, um, or in this case, a continent in particular, yeah, Europe. Um, so there have been some recent decisions uh, interpreting that Schrems II decision and applying it. Uh, again, these cases came out of um, France, um, the highest administrative court in France, um, and then two decisions by data protection authorities in Germany and Portugal. Um, so just a really 
brief recap on on the situation. The French court really kind of uh, laid out some some safeguards uh, for managing these concerns and allowing the use of a third country's service provider. Uh, so in that case, an e health service provider was hosting its personal data on Amazon Web Services Sorrel in Luxembourg. So the data was staying within Europe, yet the court acknowledged that there was still a threat of access to the data by U.S. government, uh, U.S. public authorities because Amazon is an American organization and subject to, uh, to American uh, regulations in particular on surveillance and the acquisition of data from organizations. Um, and so the court noted that uh, in this case, using the uh, American service provider was okay, and they kind of gave uh, they gave three reasons for that. The first, uh, the first, uh, the court considered the sensitivity of the hosted data, um, and found that the that the data was merely identifying an individual. And uh, through email addresses, I believe it was, and this did not rise to the level of uh, of concerning sensitive data. And then the court also noted that there were strict re data retention uh, limitations, so the data was deleted after three months, and users could delete their online account at any time. From there, the court turned to those legal safeguards, uh, in particular the use of standard contractual clauses that were upheld by the, uh, by the Court of Justice in the Schrems II decision. And in those legal safeguards, uh, AWS had committed itself and committed resources to challenging, uh, challenging access requests and public access requests. So again, the court noted that favorably and then turned to the technical safeguards that seems to really ensure that the data is protected and, and that data cannot be compelled by public authorities. So in this case, um, there was end-to-end -end encryption, and the encryption key was not held by Amazon Web Services, but was held by a trusted third party in France, and therefore subject to European Union laws. So these three factors uh, were really were vital to the court, really the sensitivity of the hosted data, um, retaining um, strict retention limitations, including those standard contractual clauses and uh, these technical safeguards, in particular encryption and, again, that key being held by a third party other than Amazon Web Services. So the, that case in France gave us a, a lot of helpful guidance for managing um, data transfer or managing the use of uh, service provi American service providers. So the second case uh, came out of Germany and concerned the use by an organization uh, of the service provider MailChimp in its marketing of automation and email marketing services. So in that case, the, uh, the, this was a complaint to the Data Protection Authority. Uh, the data subject lodged uh, a complaint arguing the data transfer was unlawful. And in analyzing the situation, the Data Protection Authority uh, in Bavaria noted that there were the inclusion of standard contractual clauses, but there were no uh, additional technical safeguards uh, protecting that data. And so the, the Data Protection Authority concluded that there was, a, that, this, that this situation did violate the holding in Schrems II, but nonetheless did not take enforcement action uh, because the, in this case, the email addresses again were not sensitive data and the company only used MailChimp twice and then immediately stopped using the service. So the violation in that case was minor um, and did not, and at, at its most constituted uh, negligence. So again, it, here we have a case where there aren't those technical safeguards uh, as there were in the French case, which, uh, um, which allowed the Data Protection Authority to conclude that this in fact was an unlawful transfer but again, did not then take in enforcement actions. Uh, and then most recently on April 27th, we got a decision from the Data Protection Authorities in Portugal. Uh, in particular, the uh, Portuguese Data Protection Authority um, 
issued an order requiring that the National in Institute of Statistics suspend within 12 hours any of its data transfer, uh, any of its international transfers of personal data, specifically in regard to this census data being collected, noting that the United States and, and other third countries do not have an adequate level, level of protection. Um, and therefore, the data transfers could, could were were unlawful. So this this decision um, concerned again this National Institute using the California-based company called Cloudflare. Cloudflare, um, again noting that uh, the American-based company is subject to U.S. Uh, surveillance legislation, which imposes a, a a legal obligation again to grant unrestricted access to personal data. Um, so again, this, uh, this case concerned, um, concerned a data protection authority looking at the data uh, that was being hosted uh, or, and sent to a, a US-based service provider. Uh, so really, in, in particular, the, there are some takeaways that we can, we can learn from these situations in, in dealing with this really complex issue of international data transfers. Uh, again, really turning to the decision by the French court, um, demonstrating that uh, the sensitivity of the data is considered uh, through perhaps a data protection impact assessment. The Portuguese Data Protection Authority in their case noted that the DPIA was uh, limited in scope and that did not really contextualize um, all of the risk factors. Um, so that's one thing to, for organizations to consider the level of your data protection impact assessment, what you're considering, making sure the scope is uh, really takes into account all the risks and considers the sensitivity of the personal data that is being collected and transferred to US-based service providers. Um, then, uh, you know, of course, implementing those standard contractual clauses uh, as the court held were legal in the Shrums 2 decision and including provisions that um, that layout financial resources seems to be in the French case was really an important, um, which reserved resources to challenge uh, challenge access requests by U.S. public authorities, um, and really Im imposing that burden, that obligation within the within the contract. Uh, and then uh, the the third main factor were those technical safeguards, again using encryption uh, and having that. Uh, that key uh, to decrypt the data held by a trusted third party and not the US-based service provider. Um, and so again, this is really relevant and really important in the aftermath of that Schrems 2 decision, uh, which really brings up uh, some concerns uh, related to data, data localization. Again, that requirement to keep data within the um, borders of a particular jurisdiction, kind of the associated costs with hosting data in a particular area, you know, organizations may have to allocate resources to host that data in in a, in Europe at, at this point, which again raises really big concerns, especially considering that the GDPR forms the basis for many uh, countries who are now examining and implementing their own privacy legislation. Of course, we saw this in the context of Brazil. And, and Turkey, and and now with uh, this emerging legislation in China and India, who might themselves impose uh, data localization requirements, uh, and this really raises, you know, issues for organizations uh, that want to work across borders and transfer data uh, across borders. Um, the situation is, in some sense, only growing more complex, uh, especially if other jurisdictions begin to adopt their own data lo localization requirements. Um, and there are a lot of associated issues with uh, yeah, harms associated with that data localization that I will get into in a, a forthcoming sound bites. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn to proposed legislation in China and India. Well, right now, turning to China and India, both countries are moving forward with the process of enacting their own uh, privacy legislation. This, of course, is really relevant because when these laws uh, come into enforcement, they will cover more than 3 billion people. 
Um, the Chinese bill is called, or the Chinese law is called the Personal Information Protection Law, and India's is called the Personal Data Protection Bill. There is no um, definitive date for the laws coming into enforcement. We're still really in the uh, debating and promulgating stage. Um, now, the, the situation in China seems to be moving um, quite rapidly. There was a standing committee of the National People's Congress um, who discussed the data protection law uh, during their session that lasted from April 26th to April 29th. Um, and the Indian law has been discussed and debated for quite a long time. Um, so, you know, we expect to see some movement on those in the coming months. Um, so now I'm going to discuss just a bit of high level um uh, going through some of the provisions of of the laws and, and both laws are modeled on the GDPR because that's important to keep in mind uh, both pieces of legislation um, would regulate how data is stored processed and transferred the Indian law uh, does something interesting it creates a new category of personal data called critical personal data which is distinct from sensitive personal data that definition in the Indian law is similar to the GDPR. The critical personal data would be subject to data localization requirements. So this idea is not going anywhere. Um, it, while the sensitive personal data would be allowed to be transferred in certain, in certain circumstances, you know, including those safeguards as have been often discussed in the af aftermath of the Schrems II decision. The Indian law would create a data protection authority, uh, require uh, similar consent requirements as the, those in the GDPR, and allow for more control by the individual over their data, uh, giving the data data subject rights similar to those uh, under the GDPR. There are some lingering concerns with the legislation. In particular, the Indian government would be able to exempt government agencies from the legislation's requirement there is no discussion of non-personal data included in the bill. And again, this topic of data localization and how it's going to play out is something that is um, really relevant to keep in mind as there are localization requirements in both the Indian and Chinese bills. Um, and again, that is uh, the requirement that data stays within the jurisdiction um, so turning to the uh, Chinese Personal Information Protection Law, the uh, the law was first unveiled uh, and made made available for public consultation on October twenty first of twenty twenty. Again, many of the provisions are inspired by the GDPR, uh, including those data protection pr principles uh, such as transparency, fairness, purpose limitation data minimization, limitation, uh, uh, limited re retention, data accuracy and accountability that we are familiar with from the GDPR. Again, the regulation will apply to the processing of individuals' data that takes place in China, regardless of the individual's nationality, as the law is currently written. Organizations outside of, outside of China that fall under the scope of the law would be required to establish a dedicated organization or representative in China. The definitions of personal data and processing are similar to the definitions in the GDPR. There is the notable distinction that there is uh, between the Chinese law and the GDPR, that there is no distinction between a cr controller and processor. Instead, there's one definition for personal data processor, and this definition is similar to the, the definition of controller under the GDPR. Uh, the Chinese law would um, would uh, introduce definitions of consent similar to the GDPR, as well as uh, other legal basis for the processing of personal data, again, similar to, uh, to the GDPR. And this is a significant diversion from the cybersecurity law that was enacted in 2016, whose only legal basis uh, for the processing of data was, was consent. And there are uh, additional um, opt-in and disclosure requirements for the processing of sensitive data. So this is data, again, related to ethnic groups or religious beliefs, 
personal biometric data or or fi financial data for for just some uh, just some examples. Um, specific disclosure and consent uh, would be required for the transfer or sharing of data, as well as automatic decision making. And the definition of this of what this separate consent uh, would look like remains remains undefined. Um, some uh, some interesting aspects of the Chinese laws that will work in tandem with the cybersecurity law of 2016 uh, that I just mentioned. In that law, it required um, it, it made the consideration of whether or not an organization wa was a critical information infrastructure operator. This is the definition from the law. And if the organization was deemed so after a security ex assessment conducted by the Chinese authority, then that data would have to again stay within China. Now this new law would be more expansive on data localization requirements. Um, any processing of personal data over a certain amount in China would be subject to those data localization requirements. This number threshold uh, is, is not yet clear yet or it's not yet established and will be done so by the Cyberspace Administration after the law is, is promulgated. Um, as with the Indian laws, with the GDPR, there are the inclusion of more data subject rights, um, you know, the right to data portability, the right to uh, deletion, the right to correction, um, you know, just some of the new data subject rights that would go into effect in China that we are familiar with in Europe uh, from the GDPR. Uh, both laws in India and China include, um, include fines and, and enforcement provisions. Um, and so again, it's really, uh, it's, it'll be a really uh, interesting development, something to look out for the perspective pieces of legislation in China and India covering more than 3 billion people. I mean, that market is enormous and, and growing. Uh, as these countries are developing and developing their nascent technology, their uh, nascent economy. And so it will definitely be something to, to look out for. So turning uh, to the UK, there is a, a case being argued before the Supreme Court at the moment that is garnering a, a lot of attention. Uh, this case at its core is about an individual, individual seeking to represent a, a class uh, of harmed individuals without those individuals all opting into the, the legal proceedings. So that is the uh, basic issue of the case Lloyd v. Google. This case has reached the Supreme Court um, after the High Court originally dismissed this case in October of 2018. Uh, that decision was later overturned by the Court of Appeals in 2019 and is now on final appeal uh, to the Supreme Court. And again, the, uh, the action is Mr. Lloyd uh, is seeking permission to serve a representative claim uh, for an, an estimated 4.4 million iPhone users and bringing this claim against Google, which allegedly uh, unlawfully gathered in a data subject information uh, back in 2011 and 2012. Um, Lloyd is seeking uh, at least uh, one and a half billion to three billion uh, pounds in damages. Again, the, that factual issue of whether or not Google violated the law is not the question for consideration. The current question before the court is whether or not Mr. Lloyd again can bring this action on behalf of, uh, of a representative class. And this, uh, this case would have really large impl implications again for class actions and representative actions in the UK. Again, currently in order for a representative action to be brought in the UK system, all of those members of that class have to affirmatively opt in to be a part of that class. That representative class then brings the case before the court. In this situation, the individual, Mr. Lloyd, is hoping to sue Google by himself on behalf of the class without all of these individuals opting in. Uh, this again, would the, if the Supreme Court grants Mr. Lloyd's question, this could uh, you know, radically change, um, it will radically change how representative actions are brought in the United Kingdom. Um, you know, looking at uh, the situation as it currently is, 
British Airways was fined um, and on on the back of this uh, on this data breach. Um, there is a class action that is in the process of being filed, um, and that class is uh, collecting members, and this uh, this action is is ongoing. So in uh, in the legal in the legalese, the Supreme Court is uh, in fact reviewing two issues. Uh, the first, a non-trivial infringement of the Data Protection Act, which does not cause any material damage or disclosure, can nevertheless result in uniform per capita damages being awarded awarded for loss of control of personal data. And uh, the second issue, it is not necessary for members of class to be identified in order to demonstrate the same interest when pursuing a representative class action. Uh, there were two days of arguments in the case on April 28th and April 29th, and, and the judgment is not expected for uh, a few months. But it's just something to have on the radar as, uh, as we think about representative and class actions and those potential consequences for businesses and organizations who operate in the United Kingdom. And then uh, the last bit of uh, you know, interesting news, potentially interesting news, uh, is, um, uh, is uh, some open letters that were sent to Spotify by the activist organization called Access Now. Uh, in particular, Access Now is seeking public commitments from Spotify not to use a, a speech recognition patent. So this patent was filed in 2018 and granted uh, this year on January 12th. And the technology claims to be able to detect, among other things, emotional state, gender, age, and accent um, by, your, by your speech. Uh, drawing on contextual clues, uh, excuse me, contextual cues such as uh, intonation, stress, and rhythm, which provide clues as to whether a user was happy, angry, sad, or neutral for the purposes of um, offering better music recommendations. So it's just uh, an interesting uh, piece of information uh, to think about. I don't know what the... Uh, real outcomes or uh, potential uh, issues surrounding surrounding this bit of technology. Um, it is a really interesting uh, s discussion uh, potentially about the state of technology uh, and what what technology is able to detect from our voice. Uh, and Amazon uh, has also uh, has also gotten a patent for its uh, for Alexa and uh, similar speech recognition uh, technology uh, innovation. So how, um, how that technology can be used, uh, I will leave that open to a speculation. Just wanted to end with a quick concluding note on uh, some interesting developments in uh, speech recognition uh, and pattern, or yes, in speech recognition technology, uh, in particular from Spotify and, and Amazon. So. Uh, Spotify has uh, committed not to, or not, uh, they haven't committed, publicly committed to not using the technology in the future. They have just said that up to this point, they have not yet used it. So, uh, yeah, something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, last sound bites, we talked a bit about um, the Apple's updates to their app tracking transparency. I showed you how to um, disable those requests. So, um, so here now we have a, another little interesting bit of um, of news uh, that personally that could personally affect uh, individuals. Um, and with that, I hope you have a great day, great rest of your week, uh, and thanks for tuning. In.